our Sermon of the Mount series. Last week we looked at chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. We heard teachings that are as relevant today as the day they were spoken. I've gotten a lot out of this study, personally, from the Sermon on the Mount, and you know, I've heard it all my life, and you have a tendency to think you've gotten everything there is to get, but it has really spoken to me, and I appreciate that. The first bit of advice that Jesus teaches there in verse 1 is don't judge. That basically means don't have a critical spirit, because you'll be measured by the measure you use on others. We shouldn't hold others to a standard that we wouldn't want applied to ourselves. So when you're tempted to criticize, keep that in mind. You'll have the same measure used on you that you're using on others. So that would behoove us to cut people a little bit of slack, to think the best. Then Jesus goes on there in verse, uh, in verse 7, he says, Ask, seek, and knock. And the tense of those verbs, it means to keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. It's a continuous process. All of those words are metaphors for prayer. And they escalate. Ask, seek, and knock escalate in their fervency. And so when the, if the Father does not answer, when we think He should, we should persevere with the full confidence that He will respond according to His perfect will. And then in verse 12, Jesus shared what has come to be known as the golden rule. Matthew 7, 12, In everything do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. That's all they had at that point was the law and the prophets. They didn't enjoy the New Testament that we enjoy Today, this saying, the golden rule, summarizes the behavior and attitude that Jesus expects from his followers. And if you'll recall, last week I told you that uh, there had been a negative version stated previously to this time. Other philosophers and religious leaders had, had a negative version of this, but Jesus is the first to turn it around and make it positive, proactive, intentional. He's saying it's not enough just to avoid treating others badly. That's pretty easy for most of us. We can bite our lip or restrain ourselves and avoid treating others badly. But he says go out of your way purposely and intentionally pursue the good of others. He, that's quite a challenge, isn't it? Particularly those others that we may not particularly care for. But I have found in my life, if I intentionally pursue the good of someone whose behavior is maybe not quite to my liking, uh, my attitude toward that person changes. And when you treat someone lovingly, emotions of fondness and affection usually follow. So Jesus' teachings here on the sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount are extremely practical for uh, human relationships. In today's message, Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount with four analogies. There's four twos that he contrasts in our message today. All four call his audience to not only hear his words, but to put them into practice. To respond to his teaching. To practice what he preached. Now, when I was in college, we had a philosophy club. And uh, we had to spend so many hours outside of class and compared to what we spent in class if we expected to get an A in the course. And he said, just form a club and just sit around and philosophize. Just talk about philosophy, theology, meaning of life, purpose, all, just sit around and talk about it, discuss it. Well, that's easy. It's easy to talk about it. It's easy to study it in Sunday school class. It's easy to nod your head and say amen, and then go away unchanged. The Bible says, don't just be a hearer, be a doer. And that's what Jesus is calling us to in this closing portion today. Andrew Carnegie said, as I grow older, I pay less attention to what men say. I just watch what they do. Actions do speak louder than words. And if what you say con 
contradicts what you do, people are going to believe what you do. So that's what we're looking at. When all is said and done, more is said than done. That's true of most of us. Jesus is calling his listeners to change that. He's calling his listeners to to choose between two different ways of life, between genuine and counterfeit, emphasizing that our authenticity is not determined by what we say. Talk's cheap. It's determined by what we do. And the first analogy is two kinds of roads. There's two kinds of roads we see here in Matthew 7, verse 13. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and men, many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. It reminds me of a poem that we read in high school English class. You probably know the one I'm talking about. It's called The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. It starts out, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And then it concludes, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Jesus is challenging us to take the narrow road, the straight and narrow road. Some have called it the high road. And like Frost said, we can't travel both. We can't travel the narrow and the broad at the same time. We cannot travel the high and the low roads at the same time. The road we're on makes all the difference, not only in the journey, whether it's smooth, bumpy, straight, winding, but in the destination. There are two destinations at the end of these roads. One is destruction and one is life. One road is narrow with a small gate. The Greek word translated narrow literally means compressed or restricted. Yes, there are boundaries on the narrow road. There are parameters that define where we should and should not travel. This is true. But as we travel this road, we realize that the boundaries are for our own, our own good. These boundaries are actually liberating. What initially looks like restriction is actually the way to freedom, to the life we were created to live. I've likened it many times... I'm visual, I like to visualize what things mean, and I think of it as a funnel. And I notice, you know, Jesus talks about the, the eye of a needle. It's kind of like the end of a funnel. You, he lays it right on out there what the cost of discipleship is. He said, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. He tells you what it's like. And that's kind of like entering into the narrow end of a funnel. But the farther you travel in this road, you actually realize that what you thought were restrictions were actually liberating. I think of the fellows that I hung out with in uh, high school. I thought they were having all the fun. I mean, they were indulging in all these sinful behaviors and habits and things like that, and I knew I was dead meat if I did that, so uh, I found it to be just exactly the opposite. A lot of my friends from high school have addictions and scars and and things along the way that they've picked up through this uh, loose living that they so, so called enjoyed as they went through school. And I found that the, the restrictions that I, the, my parents placed upon me have been liberating in, uh, as I go through life. And going back to the funnel, the sinful life is like going into the broad end of a funnel it looks like you're experiencing all these freedoms and having the, living the life, living the dream, but those freedoms start to constrict as you travel on, and before you know it, you're in bondage. So don't let the devil deceive you in this way. The same root word narrow is used to describe the tribulations or persecutions that Jesus' followers would face. True, this life contains many challenges, but Jesus never denied that. Those who are not willing to follow Jesus, in other words, go where he goes and do what he does and say what he says, those who are not willing to deny themselves and take up their cross will find 
this gate too small and too restrictive. That's why Jesus said, few will find it. Well, the second road is a broad, wide road. The word translated broad means wide or spacious. It depicts a wide open path with no boundaries or restrictions. Now, that sounds great at face value. There are no rules or regulations to prevent people on this road from going wherever they want to go or doing whatever they want to do. They just follow their own selfish inclinations. Many people choose this road due to its easy and popular convenience. It looks attractive at first. It reminds me of the little engine that was going down the track, and he, he thought his track was too restrictive. He wanted to take out across the field. It looked pretty inviting over there. Well, he didn't get far. Because he wasn't designed to travel in the pasture. He found that as long as he stayed on the track, he could go coast to coast, travel wherever he wanted to go. So what he perceived as restrictive was actually liberating, and vice versa. The, what you might call Broadway Christianity is a bumpy ride, very dangerous, and it won't get us to heaven. The wide road doesn't lead to heaven. You choose the road, you choose the, definition, the destination. Charlene and I were going to uh, a conference earlier this week in Branson, and we decided to take 76, which we don't usually do because of the curves. We wanted to see some pretty foliage, see how much the trees had changed and so on, so we're driving 76, and I said, I don't remember that drop-off like that without any guardrails. I mean, the road just goes right at the edge of it, and you're down in the valley. She said, I don't remember that either. I kind of like my guardrails. I don't plan on hitting them, but I just like to know they're there. It makes me feel secure when I'm driving. I like guardrails. We were going up Pikes Peak and thousands of feet down, and there's no guardrail. We need guardrails in life. We need guidelines, parameters, spiritual guardrails, or we might go over the edge. We may fall into sin, addiction, destructive behaviors that take away the freedom that we seek to enjoy. I like the white lines on the side of the road. Sometimes it's dark or foggy and you, it's hard to know where the road stops and the shoulder begins. I like that yellow line in the middle so that guy that I'm meeting, he knows where his lane stops and mine begins. I like that. The Bible serves that purpose for us. It tells us how to live the most abundant life possible. This is our spiritual uh, guardrails. A roadmap. Reminds me of a song that Ricky Van Shelton sang a few years back. You probably remember. It's a long, narrow road. Only the good Lord knows where it leads in the end, but you've got to begin. So keep your hands on the wheel. Believe in things that are real. Take your time. Keep it between the lines. That's what Jesus is calling his followers to do here. These final verses from the Sermon on the Mount, keep it between the lines. Choose the narrow road. These two roads and the people who travel them are vastly different. Sometimes not so much in their appearance, although that's the case sometimes. It's, it's more of an orientation. It's more of a mindset. It's a change of the heart. When we, when we become Christians, the old passes away. We become new creatures in Christ. We think differently. We act differently. We've got different motivations. We've got different goals. We've got different responses to the world. Their people are vastly different. Their journey is different. They end up at two opposite destinations. The narrow road leads to life. The broad road leads to destruction. In these concluding moments, Jesus called his audience to carefully decide how they would respond to his teaching. He, he laid out a choice, two roads. 
to make the right choice between two vastly different options. And let me stress, there are only two. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. There's no middle road. You're either on the narrow road or you're on the broad road this morning. He called his followers to choose not only to listen to him, but to put his teaching into practice. You're here listening to his teaching this morning, and I commend you for that. But once we leave the, this building, then it'll be time to put what we've heard into practice. Jesus knew that his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount would not be easy to follow, but he called his disciples to choose the narrow road anyway. Wide open and unrestrictive roads might look inviting at first, but they lead to death and destruction. True disciples follow the narrow path of holy living that leads to life and not destruction. The next analogy that Jesus mentions is two kinds of prophets. Verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Just as there are two roads to travel, there are two kinds of prophets, preachers, teachers, spiritual leaders. Jesus warned his followers against listening to false prophets. They pose as sheep, true followers, but they are ferocious wolves, threatening to devour the careless believer. You've heard the term sheep in wolves' clothing. That's wolf in sheep's clothing. That's what he's talking about here. They're sometimes difficult to distinguish from true sheep. And so Jesus says, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. It's sad to admit this morning, but all quote-unquote spiritual leaders are not spiritual. Believers must not only examine the words, but also the life of the leader. He was a pastor to more than 5,000 members of the People's Temple. Now there's a red flag right there, the People's Temple. It should be the Lord's Temple. He was a champion of the underprivileged, a defender of the rights of minorities. You're probably a step ahead right now. But in 1978, he proclaimed himself Messiah. That's a giant red flag. Everybody should have bailed at this point, but they didn't. He led hundreds of his church members to establish a commune in Guyana. He called it Jonestown. Another red flag. In November 1978, a delegation visited Jonestown to investigate allegations of abuse. Jones sent gunmen to kill them. After learning that some had escaped to tell their story, he ordered his followers to drink poison punch. Over 900 people, a third of them children, died that day. And if you're alive in 1978, you probably remember the, the pictures on Newsweek and Time and the news magazines of the day. 900 people dead, side by side, in rows. Victims of a false teacher, Jim Jones. That's why Jesus said, beware of false teachers. It doesn't end up well. Jesus calls his disciples to carefully examine the fruit of those who call themselves teachers and preachers. He said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. He expects us to be discerning to examine the fruit. Otherwise, we might be led astray. The third analogy that he mentions is two kinds of disciples. Two kinds of disciples. Verse 21, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, emphasis on the says, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does. Emphasis on does. The will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. There's two kind of disciples. After talking about true and false prophets, Jesus shifted his attention to true and false disciples. The previous warning dealt with leaders. This one deals with the followers. These are some of the most sobering verses in the Bible. Can you imagine hearing those words? Depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. I can't imagine anything more terrifying than that. Jesus said that not everyone who calls him Lord will enter the kingdom. False professions are easy to make. Talk's cheap. But Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's the evidence. He said, only he who does the will of my Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. The test of discipleship is not only a profession of faith, but it's obedience to the will of the Father. When a person professes faith in Jesus but continues to travel on the broad, self-centered road, that's a contradiction. When a person professes faith in Christ but their behavior indicates otherwise, that's a contradiction. Jesus demands more than superficial words. He wants our full devotion and obedience. We can't fool God. He looks beyond our pious words and our religious activity. He wants a true personal relationship. Personal relationship cannot be replaced by religion and good deeds. The last contrast that Jesus mentioned here is the two kinds of builders. Two kinds of builders. Verse 24. Therefore, therefore connects what he has just said with what he is about to say. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Those of you who have any experience in building know the importance of a firm foundation. The house I grew up in didn't have a foundation. It was sitting on rocks, and it was all out of kelter and crooked and sloped and all that sort of thing. So when I was about 12 years old, my dad and I decided we were going to put a foundation under that house. We leveled it up and got it all nice and level and built a foundation, and that house from then on stood firm and solid and stands to this day. You can't overemphasize the importance of a foundation. And I hope that everyone here today is building a firm foundation on the rock that will stand no matter what storms come in our life. You see, the time to build a foundation is before the house crumbles. The time to build, to put a roof on is before it rains. The time to cut wood is before it gets cold and there's snow on the ground. If you've got smooth sailing right now, you ought to be working on that foundation, the foundation of scripture and belief and good deeds and obedience and all of those spiritual disciplines that'll see us through when the going gets tough. There was a fellow, he was, uh, there, his ship was in a storm and about to go down and he was at the helm with, at the wheel and someone said, I think, it, I think you ought to be praying. 
He said, I prayed when the sun was shining. Now it's time to pilot the ship. Build that firm foundation. Don't build on sand. Jesus finished his sermon with a parable that contrasts two kinds of builders. One builder built his house on a solid foundation of rock. The other built his on sand. Both houses probably looked trustworthy and reliable. They may have been identical. You couldn't tell by looking that there was any difference in the two until the storm came. I'm not sure that adversity builds character. Maybe it just reveals character. The storm came. One house stood firm. One did not. When the rain, floods, and wind tested the strength of the two homes, the house on the sand was destroyed, and the house built on the rock stood strong and safe. The storm, of course, represents the trials and difficulties of life that challenge and threaten us. Probably many of you are thinking of that uh, song we learned growing up. The wise man built his house upon the rock. We say that three times. The rains came down. What came up? Floods came up. The foolish man built his house on the sand. The rains came down. The floods came up. What does his house do? It's flat. So build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. The blessings will come down as your prayers go up. Build your life on the Lord. Jesus went on to explain this parable. I love it when he explains his parables. That way there's no room for interpretation. He goes on to explain it. That the house built on sand is like a person who hears Jesus' words but doesn't put them into practice. The house built on the rock is a person who hears Jesus' words and does put them into practice. Both heard. The difference was in their response. The bad builder heard, but the good builder listened and put Jesus' teaching into practice. The difference between the builders might seem small until the tests of life come. And then it's obvious. So true discipleship is not a matter of merely listening. It's not even of merely agreeing. It's not a matter of nodding your head and saying amen. Preach it, brother. It's a matter of going out and practicing a person does not become holy by hearing holy words and mouthing holy praises. Jesus is not looking for people who are content with merely listening. He's looking for people who are willing to follow, obey, put His words into action. It won't always be easy. Jesus told us it wouldn't be easy. The path of following Jesus will sometimes be narrow and unpopular. It will cost us something. Yet if we obediently follow Him, we can be sure of several things, one of which is blessed assurance that He will be with us every step of the way. Our lives will bear meaningful fruit. Our path will lead to abundant life, not only in this life on the journey, but especially in that heavenly destination. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we thank you so much for Jesus' clear and concise teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're so glad, Lord, that they've been preserved for our reading and study. And Lord, we just pray that uh, we would not be hearers only, that we might be doers of what we've heard, that we might go out from this place and practice what you have preached. We thank you for these that are here today, and we pray, Lord, that you administer to each and every one whether the need might be emotional or spiritual or physical or whatever the case might be, we pray, Lord, that you would meet that need in each and every person. We pray, Lord, that you would go with us as we go from this place and help us to be a factor for you wherever we go. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are